Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitriol Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Phil Ferrone from Vitorino Consultants of New York as senior author to speak about his paper on ophthalmologic presentations of incontinentia pigmentae. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Tim. Always a pleasure to talk with you. I appreciate the invitation. Well, you know, you and I both realize how unique um, pediatric retina is as a practice, and um, it really requires a differential focus that's that's not typically the way we look at adult patients. Yeah. So can you tell me what, what really drove you to look at this series and, and what you've learned from that experience? Sure. Well, um, I became interested in incontinentia pigmenta years ago because I'm the uh, principal resource for a, a large health system here in New York, and we have a children's hospital, which is quite large, and we draw referrals from the New York metro area. I became uh, friendly with a pediatric dermatologist who saw a lot of these kids early on with their vesicular skin lesions and referred them to me for evaluation. So I, many of these kids I got very early in their uh, course. And then as time went by, anyone who saw a proliferative retinopathy or peripheral uh, dropout retinal uh, issues in a kid, they would... Uh, people would send to me because some of them, some of those patients, as you know, are not diagnosed early on, even though they might have a little vesicular lesion, it's just not picked up. And then they wind up with the little swirls on their trunk or that are, that are not that impressive typically. Right. And um, then when you ask the mom, when the mom brings in the patient, ask the mama, have you had similar findings when you were born or do you have any changes on your skin like this? They would say yes. And, you know, it's easier to pick up once you, uh, determine the family history, though some of these can happen sporadically, as you know. But so anyway, that's how I became interested in conscientious pigmenti. And before I knew it, I had 18, 20, you know, 24 patients and uh, over a long time period with a very long um, history associated with them from early on. And so I thought of putting them together because when I'd look in the literature, I never found anything that was very informative or comprehensive about how to manage these patients. You read case reports about horror stories about retinal detachment. They present when they're babies and then they're lost to follow up. And they have a couple of cases out of Japan where they came back a few years later and they have bilateral tractional detachments through the macula with knife like folds, you know, bad outcomes. Right. So, but when you, I would ask amongst our friends, how do you surveil these patients? No one would really have a good, uh, convincing gestalt of how to do it. And so I said, well, let me look at these patients. And that's what I did. And I gathered them and I had quite a few with a minimum of six months of follow-up. And, you know, we wound up, uh, we had to exclude a few um, uh, who didn't have a long enough follow-up, but we wound up with uh, 18 patients and 36 eyes and uh, with an average of uh, seven years of follow-up. So I was, I was happy with that. So I think the important, you, there are so many clinical pearls in what you just said. First, understanding that there is a differential and recognizing how you establish the diagnosis. And, and I think all of us do look at this, at the cutaneous features of this disease yeah. in our kids. So yeah. it's not like we look at our adult patients in the way we look at our kids. And then you mentioned monitoring. So often we're able to monitor very early with an examination awake in these very, very small babies. But then you've, you've really focused on taking the child to the operating room for an examination under anesthesia. And I know also that you've been a strong proponent of, of wide field imaging and fluorescein yeah. angiography. Yeah. So tell me how, how, when you first see these kids, what's, what's your schedule for them? Well, I'll go back a little bit because, I mean, the median age in this series was 11 months, right? So these are, and that was with a 17 and a half year old coming in down the line with retinal traction, regmatogenous retinal detachment that was included in the series that never had any screening as a young person and uh, just showed up 
with the tractional detachment. So that skewed the mean, but the median was 11 months and the mean was, was similar. So uh, basically when I see them, you know, they, they come in and it's intimidating for the parents because otherwise, you know, aside from the vesicular lesions, the ch babies are normal, right? So the, the young parents are, are coming in and say, okay, well, you taking a, you look and you say, looks pretty good. Periphery is good. You can usually get a, a, as you know, a quite, quite a good exam on a one year old or six month old, whatever it may be. And I would always tell them that we need to do an exam under anesthesia and do wide field fluorescein angiography because I, many times I was surprised by the um, degree of findings and significant findings, which required laser. And over half these patients in the series had uh, retinal findings associated with their IP, which is not what the um, uh, literature was previous to this. Previously, it was about 35%. But that number is not taken from a population that had wide field fluorescein angiography in the kids early on. So I bring them to the OR, do wide field fluorescein, and if they had significant dropout or uh, standing of the vessels or neovascularization peripherally, I would treat the avascular area. And as you know, taking care to treat the horizontal meridians less densely and less intensely to protect the long ciliary arteries and nerves, because I have seen the complication of a baby with IP that was treated very intensely, um, where unfortunately they had intersegment ischemia and, uh, and uh, following uh, following that retinal detachment and um, and just a bad outcome. And as you know, that can happen with any peripheral ablation in a baby or adult eye. But I think it's it's very important for the readers to remember to be careful of those long ciliary arteries and nerves because the baby's asleep and they usually have more pigmentation out there and, and you can um, get burns that are a little too hot occasionally. So I think that the key is examination under anesthesia, wide field imaging, fluorescein angiography, and then targeted laser therapy based on clinical findings. You seem to have approached laser earlier than many people had in the past. And it seems to me that that played a significant beneficial role in lowering the risk of detachment. There's no question about it. Uh, none of our babies, first of all, about three quarters of them, one treatment was enough. They did not need a supplemental treatment. And for the 26% that needed a supplemental treatment. They just needed a little touch up, usually along the posterior border. Now, they're usually, they were lightly pigmented eyes. So as you know, sometimes it's difficult to see. It's not like an RP where there's a ridge. You know, so you could have a little bit, you could have further ischemic progression, of course, or you could just be conservative and have a little area that wasn't treated as uh, completely as you wanted to initially in that 25, 26% of patients. But the bottom line is one treatment in three quarters of the patients did the job. No patients that were treated with one or more than one laser went on to um, develop a retinal detachment. Zero, zero. So, um, Phil, some, some people have suggested that there is a role for anti-VEGF in this condition also, much in the way that we've seen that evolution in ROP. Um, your paper really focused on laser, but are you currently moving toward a combination therapy or, or do you think that anti-VEGF is, is, plays a small beneficial role here, if at all? Well, you know, as you know very well, like in ROP, there's that acute phase, right, where you have to quiet things down. It's usually very aggressive. This is different. This is not like an action potential disease, right? Uh, this is more, it ramps up slowly and then you get into trouble down the line. Well, if you just hit it in the acute phase here, it's still gonna keep on going, much like proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and you're not gonna keep on injecting these kids with anti-VEGF. So there's, you know, in theory, there's nothing wrong with anti-VEGF, but I don't really think it addresses this disease course and the persistence of this disease. So I'm a proponent of laser. You know, as I said, in most patients, you can do one treatment, you're done. You don't have to put any, any anti-VEGF in the eye or penetrate the eye. And uh, if you screen early and take uh, care of things um, promptly, then uh, I don't think you need anti-VEGF. Right. And for those people that are managing these patients that elect a period of observation before they consider treatment, I think it's really you know important to recognize how rapidly sometimes this can evolve. So it, you know, I, I think people have to be very cautious to see advanced disease and not think about treating. 
I think if you see a significant peripheral dropout or any NV in these kids, you need to ablate that area that's not perfused because they only are going to do bad things. They only become more difficult to examine. You don't want more exams under anesthesia than you absolutely need. And we know what it does untreated. It does bad things. So, uh, I think you and I also see a, um, a problem with establishing a correct diagnosis. So can you give me a little overview of, of your differential on, on these eyes for people maybe that have less experience looking at them? Yeah, well, I mean, with IP, it's easier, right? It's principally girls, right? There, I, and one patient in a series of 18 patients was a boy, but that was with because of mosaicism. As you know, it's usually X-linked dominant, so the boys don't survive. But so if it's a girl, you have to think of IP typically. And um, fever is a, on in differential, ROP, CMTC. Um, that's, I mean, those are the ones that Nori's disease doesn't really present like this. Um, those are sarco- um, sickle cell is way down the line. So, it, but it can't down the line in a eight year old with yeah. that SC disease. You know, it could look like this. But um, uh, this is, I think, pretty di- pretty uh, distinct and may overlap the most, I would say, with fever, though. There's typically no exudate. It's actually, I think, closest to CMTC. But CMTC is really rare. Right. So let me ask you, too, what what do you think the role of genetic testing is? Because initially I didn't test any of these, but now now I think that we're almost obligated to test all of them. There is no question. I agree with you completely. Every single one of these patients was tested genetically to confirm the diagnosis. It's a NEMO gene on the X chromosome. It's readily available. And I think there's no reason not to, uh, you want to test these kids and confirm the diagnosis. But again, I wouldn't wait for that to do the exam under anesthesia and the wide field fluorescein and the laser treatment. And and then if you give a, a, a single clinical pearl, what what would that be from, from this series? Oh, just one thing uh, before that is just because the mom doesn't have it, right. doesn't mean the girl doesn't have it. The, the the baby doesn't have it. So that's important to remember. Um, the, the biggest clinical pearl so you is- do, Do you do recommend a history from the mom? So we absolutely. all- Absolutely, history from the mom. mom. We even examine the mom. Right. You know, with floor, wide field fluorescein and right. of course clinically. But um, I, the biggest pearl from this is what the first time you see them, you really need to schedule an EUA with wide field fluorescein. Right. And that's not easy to do in some places because they're really young patients. Uh, but whether they're six months old or nine months old or one year old, it needs to be done importantly, because that's where it can just sneak up on you and, and, uh, create a lot of damage, um, when it's, uh, in most cases, I think avoidable. And I think the other thing that you've spoken to in the past is that if you're the clinician looking at these kids and you don't have access to the OR for EUA, or you're uncertain of the diagnosis, these are the kids that need a quick referral to somebody yeah. that can manage them. I yeah. think that's always important. I, I always feel bad for our, our adult colleagues who are like, I can't get the kid to the OR for three months. And where you and I know that that's not, yeah. accept, not going to be acceptable. Right. Yeah. That uh, should try. We should try and avoid that. Yeah. Yeah, we sure should. <laughs> Dr. Ferron, thank you so much for joining us for our author podcast tonight on your outstanding paper on ophthalmic manifestations of incontinentia pigmentae. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, Tim. It was a true pleasure. As always. As always. Have a good Bye. 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 Okay. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.